you are listening to the IFH Podcast Network. For more amazing filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, just go to ifhpodcastnetwork.com. Welcome to Inside the Screenwriter's Mind, episode number five. You must stay drunk on writing so reality cannot destroy you. Ray Bradbury, Zen and the Art of Writing. Have you ever wondered what it's like inside a screenwriter's mind? In this podcast, we explore how successful screenwriters tackle structure, plot, character, dialogue, and the film business. Get ready to go down the rabbit hole of story. Let's travel inside the screenwriter's mind with your guide, Alex Ferrari. Welcome to another episode of Inside the Screenwriter's Mind. I am your guide, Alex Ferrari. Today's show is brought to you by Bulletproof Script Coverage. Now, unlike other script coverage services, Bulletproof Script Coverage actually focuses on the kind of project you are and the goals of the project you are. So we actually break it down by three categories, micro-budget, indie film market, and studio film. There's no reason to get coverage from a reader that's used to reading tentpole movies when your movie is going to be done for $100,000. And we wanted to focus on that at Bulletproof Script Coverage. Our readers have worked with Marvel Studios, CAA, WME, NBC, HBO, Disney, Scott Free, Warner Brothers, The Blacklist, and many, many more. So if you need your screenplay or TV script covered by professional readers, head on over to CoverMyScreenplay.com. And guys, I have a special treat for you. If you are interested in getting a three-part video series on screenwriting and how to write blockbusters in Hollywood today by some Oscar winners, some multi-billion dollar screenwriters, all you got to do is head over to bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash free video series. Now, today we go inside the mind of Daniel Knopf. He is the creator and showrunner of HBO's Carnival. If you guys did not get a chance to watch that show, it is an epic piece of writing to say the least. He's also worked on Blacklist, Spartacus, and Supernatural, to name a few. And I originally spoke to Daniel on the Bulletproof Screenwriting Podcast, and I wanted to bring it on to this show because I had such an amazing time talking to Daniel and getting inside of his head and how he creates. It is a fascinating conversation, not only about screenwriting, but about the business of being a screenwriter in Hollywood. So prepare to go down the rabbit hole of story with Daniel Knopf. I'd like to welcome to the show Daniel Knopf. Thank you so much for being on the show, my friend. Oh, I'm happy to be here. So first, first off, you have, well, you have a very um, impressive career and resume, so we're going to get into a bunch of the stuff you've done. But first and foremost, how did you get started in the film industry? Crazy story that, <laughs> you know, whenever, whenever I'm, at, you know, I, I do seminars sometimes, you know, and inevitably it'd be like, how do I break into film? Which is funny anyway, because it's like, what, you know, there, because there's uh, larceny is kind of hard baked into the entertainment business. <laughs> and so the language reflects it. So it's like, you don't hear people saying, well, how do I break into accountancy or how do I break into plumbing or construction? You know, it's like, <laughs> right. but no, we got to do a B and E to get into this business. So <laughs> the, that question will come up, and uh, and and it's like I'm singularly unhelpful in a way. Mm -hmm. I mean, I was an insurance broker until I was in my mid forties. I did that for like 22, 23 years. I ran a business, and um, and while I was doing it, I was I, I'd always wanted to be a screenwriter, and and. I'd studied, um, I'd studied creative writing in, in college and grown up in Los Angeles. And so I kind of had, and I loved movies. I mean, it just, uh, it was my favorite thing. And, and, but I had three kids and I had to raise them and I had to make money. And I, there was a certain, you know, lifestyle. I wanted to have a house and, you know, be able to pay my bills and that kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. um, I kind of set it aside, um, around the time I was 22 and got married and it was like, Oh yeah, this isn't what grownups do. Um, <laughs> and then around the time I was, by the time I was 27, I was actually going insane. I mean, I was like, <laughs> like, like literally like I was not a happy camper. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and, uh, and so I was going through this crushing depression and, uh, 
I started writing again and it brought me out of it. And I realized, yeah, I'm kind of, this isn't something that I want to do. This is something that I kind of have to do. Um, I'm just, my brain's wired this way and I need to be doing something creative in order to, in order to, it's like a shark has to swim, you know, mm -hmm. I have to do this thing. Um, and so, I mean, so when people come up to me and say, God, I've always wanted to write. And I think, well, I've always wanted to be a bird. <laughs> it's like, yeah, I don't have any choice. It's like, I, so I started doing that and I focused on really developing my craft and um, writing screenplays and reading books about screenplays, you know, Sid, Field, Sid Field's book, screenplay mm -hmm. and other books where some of them were useful, some of them were completely useless taking some seminars, going to UCLA, you know, UCLA extension here in LA has some great classes. Um, and, um, and just basically focusing on learning the craft and, um, and I, uh, getting some mentors. I had, a, I, I had two very good mentors. My first mentor was Jan Fisher who wrote the lost boys. We met, um, when I was in a, uh, workshop at UCLA and uh, ended up writing some scripts together. Um, and, um, and she kind of took me under her wing and really, really taught me a lot. And then, and then uh, I reached, I hit like I hit my forties and I, and I, I said to myself and I'd put it up, I said, you know what? I'm, I, I told myself if I'm, this isn't happening by the time I'm like 40, um, I'm just going to do something else. I'm start writing, I'll write novels because it's sort of a young man's game. And, you know, breaking in is, <laughs> as any 40-something-year-old, 40, 40 you know, slightly overweight B&E guy will tell you, it's probably a lot easier when you're in your 20s. Mm -hmm. And I, um, I thought, I come from a long line of, like, really sore losers. Like, we're the guys who flip the Monopoly board and throw tennis rackets at people. <laughs> right. You know, my bro my brother always says uh, his favorite, one of his favorite things is show me a good loser and I'll show you a loser. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I just said, yeah, I'm just gonna take one more real run at this. I created a website called unmovies.com, posted the first acts of all my scripts that I'd written up to that point. Um, and you know, by then I'd had some success. I had I did sell a script in the in 1993. That, ended up being a movie for HBO called uh, Blind Justice is a, is a Western, but then nothing after that. You know, it was like, yeah, it was like, there, there was nothing. It was, it was, <laughs> yeah. It was kind of like, you know, Chuck Yeager, you know, bouncing his X 15 off of the stratosphere, you know, it's like, wow, it's coming in too hot. Um, <laughs> and, um, and so I, I was really, you know, in the crust of a slump. So I, 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 I just, created this website and put this stuff on. And I got a call from a guy, uh, Robert Keobod, who worked for a guy named uh, Scott Winant. And Scott was an Emmy winning director. And he had told Robert, you know, I'm tired of reading doctors, lawyers, and cops. Show me something different. And Robert found the first act of Carnival. And he contacted me. He says, hey, I'd like to read the rest of your pilot. And I'm thinking, what pilot? And I remember, <laughs> oh, yeah, that thing. You know, I'd, I'd, I'd taken this crazy 200 page screenplay that didn't work and thought maybe this isn't a feature. And I, I, I collapsed the first act into a pilot. Mm -hmm. And so I showed it to them and I met with them and they were very, um, they, they were, they were very helpful and they told me I needed to do a Bible and I didn't know what a Bible was. Mm -hmm. And they, I did this Bible for Carnival and then we took it to HBO and all of a sudden it was like, they bought it and, and and I was executive producing and and writing an HBO series. So I, I started my career at the very top of the heap. <laughs> I came in um, and, you know, it was weird because it was like nobody had worked with me. I'd never done another television show. I had no reputation in the business. I just came out of like left field and I'm running an HBO series. And, they're, right. you know, they only would have like, you know, four or five shows on at a time. It was pretty Mm -hmm. you know, kind of a, you know, high up kind of position. And if for somebody who was really a nobody to be in, and um, I mean, I actually got to a point, I remember reading on, 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 
IMDb that there was like a rumor going around that I didn't exist and that I was a, I was a, a pseudonym for David Lynch, which was like really <laughs> flattering, but not really good for the brand, if you can imagine. And, and so I, I did this show for two years and I really kind of hung on by my fingernails. So it was a, it was, it was, it was a kind of a terrifying experience because it's a shark tank in there. And, and, um, uh, just to answer your question, it's like to, for me to give advice to someone on how to get in, I can't really say, and I can come in, you know, oh, I was a baby writer for a while and I got a story editor job on another show and then I, you know, built that up and I went, I didn't do the same trajectory as most TV writers do. I mean, I know what that trajectory is. You graduate from film school, you pull every, every favor you can get and you try to get um, into the, into a writer's room, um, whether you're in there as a office PA and you're bringing coffee or whether you're a writer's assistant and you're just taking notes. And that's really the way into TV writer. It's you're into TV writing. It's really a very much, um, it's, 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 it's very much like the old, you know, like, you know, getting into plumbing or you know, shoemaking <laughs> back in the joining the guild. Um, it's, it, it's, it, you know, but mine, I just, I broke right through it. It's sort of the top. Now, and I've been working my way down ever since. <laughs> <laughs> so you said it was, a, it was a shark tank. Can you explain a little bit about what was about that experience that was the shark tank? Cause I mean, you have a very unique story. You're right. Most people don't start off running an HBO series. Well, I wasn't running it. I mean, I mean but you know what I mean? Like, executive producing the, it. The so. first year Ron was, was running. And, but well, really the main reason what it boils down to is, is there's a lot of money on the line and they were putting a bet on an untested talent. And that's kind of terrifying for a major corporation. Yeah, it, was like, ter- it was like 4 million an episode or something like that. Right. Yeah, it was 3.75 in the first season, as far as I know. And that was, at that time, the most expensive show on TV. I and mean, we, we had a huge cast, and we had extras and, and elements and a lot of outside days and, and some special effects. And so um, it was, it was, a, it was a, a hugely expensive undertaking. And they would have loved to have had a seasoned hand at the top. And that's what they kind of wanted to do. Um, they, they, it was like if we could find a guy who can take this this other guy's crazy idea and make it work. I'm sure they would have scraped me off at some point. Mm-hmm. Um, but they found to their kind of their horror, and, and I'm not saying this you know to pat myself on the back or anything. You know, this is what I've been told by other people who were mm-hmm. involved at the time. They said what they found was nobody else knew how to write that show, and so they were stuck with me. And so you so you wrote yourself a niche. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, really, what else? I mean, basically, what I did was I created. It's like it's like sitting out creating a board game where everything you do well is something that wins that board game, and it's custom designed for every single thing you do well. And and they realized, so I'm probably guessing to their abject horror that you know that they needed me and and they couldn't get rid of me, and it would have been easier to get rid of me because I was so green and. From my standpoint, I didn't know the rules. And when getting into Hollywood and dealing with Hollywood people and the entertainment business is a lot like suddenly getting into a time machine, finding yourself in the court of King Louis the Fourteenth, and you're there's a whole battery of sort of kabuki-like rituals and certain things that have to be said and how they're said and pecking orders. And I remember my first. I sent a memo out one time and in the insurance business, you send a memo out and you just, it's here. It is here. Everybody, here's what's going on. But you know, um, I got called by one of the executive producers. He said, what do you think you're doing? It's like, what do you mean? What am I doing? I'm sending out this memo about, you know, some nothing. Mm -hmm. Uh, He climbed up my ass about, Oh, you have to put this person's name first and this person's name second and this person's name third. And so it was really, a lot about just learning these weird customs and rituals and expectations. I also didn't know what was a reasonable ask. Like, you know, was it a reasonable ask? You know, if I said, no, let's not do this. um, 
you, you, it's pretty easy if you don't have a really strong knowledge of physical production, and I didn't back then, to step on the anthill, and I did that pretty regularly. I learned very – I'm a quick study, and I learn, and I make – I generally don't make the same mistake twice. Um, I just make every possible mistake <laughs> once. <laughs> you know? Fair enough. And, and so it was. It was. It was kind of a, 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 a jarring, terrifying kind of experience in which I was kind of hanging on by my fingernails, at, you know, at all times, and feeling like a stranger in a strange land. Um, but, but I, I did the full two years, and, and in those two years, I, I pretty much learned the lay of the land. And uh, you know, so after that, I, I knew you know exactly how how the sausage is made, and and uh, had a I really had a, a love for physical production, and asked a lot of people who were very knowledgeable questions and learning about that, and. Um, and so, you know, since then, that, that was my, Carnival was kind of my film school, you know, it was like hell of a film you know. school. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's just, there was a, there was no, there was an immense amount of, 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 of there was, there was, there was money and stature and everything riding on that. Um, I mean, our, our, the sad thing really is the expectations HBO had for the series were wholly unrealistic. Mm-hmm. And um, that's one of the things that killed us. If we went on the air on HBO now, you know, they'd be go, considered like an unmitigated success. Um, but they were saying, Oh, we expect to score higher numbers with this show than the Sopranos. And when I, the day I heard that I was going, Oh God, we are so dead because the Sopranos is mainstream drama. And whenever you get into genre stuff, even more so back then than now, mm-hmm. um, where genre has kind of, you know, oozed into mainstream, Back then, there were people where as soon as Ben heals the little girl at the beginning of the show, mm-hmm. they're going to turn it off and they're not going to turn it back on because they're going, that's not real, you know? And <laughs> that it's there's some people, no matter how well, it doesn't matter whether they listen to super good jazz or really crappy jazz. They just don't, they can't differentiate because they just don't like jazz or rap or country western. And for you know, shows that involve magic or uh, supernatural or whatever. If people aren't into that, no matter how good you you do, you're going to lose that audience. Do you think that Carnival would have had a better chance in today's environment, like on a streaming service, like to have a longer run? I suspect we would have done our full run uh, if it if it came out. If it came out, I would say if, even if it came out like two or three years after we did come out. Uh, we were really on the bleeding edge of everything. And um, people just weren't really ready for that show. And, and it, it would have been easier too, because a lot of, t- a lot of what we were doing in the first season and the first season drags quite a lot. Um, but a lot of it was about just teaching people the vocabulary of the show mm-hmm. and so that they would understand. And people, there'd never been anything on like that. It was just, it was, it was just a really weird thing, you know? I mean, it had kind of the cryptic aspects of Twin Peaks, but it was a period drama and mm-hmm. there was some historical aspects that were based on true, you know, situations and true events and other things that were, that were made up. And, and so we, we really felt like we kind of had to handhold the audience along for the, you know, the first, first, at least six episodes. So they yeah, what the rules were. Now, can you you said some you said a, a term show bible. Um, for a lot of people who are listening, they might not know what a show bible is. Can you explain how what your process was being a newbie <laughs> uh, <laughs> putting it uh, together? Just so they don't feel you know as though they're you know as though, as though they're they're dumb or anything. When my, when when Scott said, "Yeah, first you need to you know we need to get a bible," and I'm thinking, "We all going to kneel down and pray they buy it?" <laughs> no. I, I was like, uh, King James or the New American? Wait, where, what? Name your poison. Um, a show Bible is basically a document that goes into the, um, the, the milieu of, you know, the world. Uh, first, you start basically with a log line, okay? Um, uh, um, you know, the powers of, it's like a, on a war between good and evil is fought in the, in the, you know, blasted landscape of the thirties dust bowl, you know, whatever. So you come up with your, your sort of three liner or 
two line or log line. And then you start to elaborate on that and you, you get into, um, the world, um, the, the rules of the world. Um, you know, the, you might, like, I like to put use images just to set tone and give them an idea of what things are going to look like. Um, and you, you, um, you talk about the history of all the backstory. You get into the description of the, you know, it's a full blown articulation of the bottom three quarters of the iceberg and, and talk about the characters, the characters, history, you know, the you know, descriptions of who everybody is and where they come from. And then, um, and then you go into, um, you know, first season, this is your first season arc. That will be quite detailed by episode one. You do this episode two, this, and then, you know, later episodes, you're kind of, of, you know, increasingly uh, shorthanding it and giving people an idea of where the, the, the thrust of the show is and what its destination is, where when the show kind of ends, um, if, the, if it ends. I mean, a lot of shows end when nobody's watching them anymore. I mean, the most episodic dramas end when people are just tired of watching it, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but a serial, this is a serial, and, and um, it, that's, that's kind of what I put together for them. And what I did was... A very complex thing to where people are looking at it and going, wow, is this based on like real people? Cause I had like, I got bored with it. I said, when, once I heard that description, okay, here's what you have to do. I got so I started writing it and I was going, God, this is like watching paint dry. And if I'm bored, whoever's reading it, whoever's got the misfortune of reading this thing, it's going to be you know, even more, it was hake inducing, mm -hmm, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I started going, let's have a little fun with it. And, what I did is I created the whole thing sort of from the point of view of um, this intrepid university professor who had heard about this carnival and had done a bunch of research and gathered files about the actual carnival. And it, and it were fake police reports and fake newspaper articles and fake religious tracts and all kinds of stuff that he kind of gathered and put together. There was even an interview with Samson when he's like 75 years old in an old folks home, you know, mm -hmm. and he's this this sort of, you know, angry carmudgeon, you know, and, and, uh, you know, just, just like, you know, can you go on and give me some booze, you know? Um, and so I just had a blast writing it. And, and so they saw it, they've never seen anything like that. Um, and I've done that since on almost every show that I've developed because I always figure, Hey, you know, why well, screw a success, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> have some fun while you're doing it. I, I mean, it's like I'm beginning. I keep hearing different things. Some people say you need to come in with every dot, every I dotted, and every T crossed, and, and man, you know, and and and, and you know, uh, trailers, you know, uh, um, you know, um, promos, you know, the shot, you know, uh, whatever, you know, this whole thing. And then I hear other people saying the best bet's just to go in with a strong pitch. Mm -hmm. I don't know what the rules are anymore, you know? Um, yeah, well, yeah, the Netflix yeah. and Hulu and those guys come and throw everything out the window <laughs> as far as rules are concerned. Very much so. And, and you really, you know, it, it's like, um, it, it's, they, they set up shops so far, uh, you know, kind of upstream, um, that they, they wield an immense, they, in, the world, and this isn't just in Hollywood, there's the golden rule, which is he who has the gold rules. And, and in Hollywood, that's very, very, very much operative. And, you know, people like Netflix are sitting on billions and billions of dollars and they say, OK, you get some and you get some and you get some. And um, I don't know what they're, you know, which projects, what, what makes them pick out what project or, you know, whatever. Uh, it's kind of, I mean, really, I mean, sometimes I feel it's like that. There was this old show that was on, I think in the fifties before my time, but it was called the millionaire. And it was about a guy who would just go out to random people yes. and give them a million, yeah. you know, a million dollars, <laughs> <laughs> which back in the fifties would be, you know, oh, you could buy an island for a million dollars. Oh, now you can't even buy it. Now you can't even buy a house in Burbank. <laughs> Yeah, four bedroom house in Reseda, but the, you know the the, um, the with a swimming pool probably. Probably, but, uh, yeah. 
the, the it, sometimes I feel like that's what Netflix is now, you know, is kind of like all of a sudden, boom, you know, you're gifted with it. And so well, it's a very, it's a very chaotic market right now. It is pretty insane. And, and, you know, I've talked to, you know, I talked to a lot of people like yourselves who are in the business, who were in the business before Netflix. And I've seen them just disrupt this entire industry. And now players like Disney are showing up with their streaming service and Apple just talked, just said, Hey, we're going to put ours in and, uh, Comcast or I think it's like AT&T, excuse me. They have one coming out. Like there's so many of these services coming out and it's really just changing the way everything is done. Yeah, well, what's, what's interesting, too, is the impact it's had on just the way people comport themselves. Like, I think I don't know who it was. I think it was Betty Davis or one of those old actresses mm-hmm. um, was quoted as saying Hollywood's the place, the one place on earth where you can get encouraged to death, you know? <laughs> Very <laughs> true. Uh, it's extremely true. Or as I like to say, you know, when people say, hey, you know, it's good for exposure. And I go, well, people die from exposure. <laughs> 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 that, I'm gonna I'm gonna steal that line. I'm gonna steal so that's, that's, line. that's a line on a death certificate. You know, that's <laughs> the cause of death. He was exposed. Um, <laughs> exposure. So so you know, but it used to be that everybody was really super super super. I was talking to my wife about this this morning, and I was just making this observation. It used to be that people were very, very sort of sort of sort of sort of polite and genteel with each other. Mainly because you really didn't know whether this guy who was – you just had every reason to believe is a completely talentless hack, mm-hmm. okay, um, or just a straight-up bozo. Um, for all you know from your experience in six years could be running a studio. You just didn't know or could be the guy that everybody wants to do business with. So people were generally very careful with um, talent relations. You didn't want to – you wanted to, you know, it would always be, God, we really love this, but it's just not right for us right now. We were developing something similar to it or, you know, it's be always that kind of, there'd always be, we love you. We think you're great. But my agent one time called me up. It was like the sixth thing that it like not sold. And, and he says, yeah, well, they really love you. And I go, no, they don't. <laughs> they don't love me because if they love me they would buy shit from me i could wipe my ass on a piece of toilet paper and submit that and they base a show on it don't tell me they love me but but there was still that it was just sort of out of kind of out of out of not respect i wouldn't say it's out of respect i wouldn't say it was them being kind it's not kindness it was out of fear it was fear that the person who's sitting in this chair right now with us Maybe somebody we absolutely need to be doing business with later, so we don't want to burn any bridges. What I've found lately in talking to other writers and stuff is Netflix, and maybe it's because I've, I read a little bit about their their internal culture of transparency and say what's on your mind to be totally frank with people, and that's the way we do things, is there is a tendency for them to say, huh, fuck off, we're not interested, go away. I mean, it'll be just like, fuck off, go away. And you'll go, what didn't you like? What? Fuck you. We, you know, we, we didn't like it, you know, uh, something didn't work for us. So go fuck off, you know, and, and they don't give you feedback. They don't say what they're looking for. They don't want a follow up meeting and, and it's curt and it's harsh. You yeah, know, I heard that too. And, and so it, it's like, it's like, it's like, what does that bode well for them? Um, if they come sniffing around later and you know, and they're not somebody I want to do business with, they're probably going to have to throw more money at me to get me. And they'll, ha- and they'll have it because they've got the money. But I just think, you know, guys, there's a reason why there's so much ass kissing going on in Hollywood before you got here. And that's because you don't understand somebody who's at the very bottom of their game, living out of their car, this week in six months can be picking up an Oscar, you know? I mean, that's the story of the guy who wrote Dances with Wolves. He was literally living out of his car, and a year later, he got an Oscar. That's amazing. You've got to basically treat people well because people who maybe you don't need this week, you may need desperately in six months or a year. And 
And, you know, but again, I mean, it's like, like I said, it's all sort of part of the chaos right now. Mm -hmm. I don't really care. It doesn't affect me. It doesn't really affect my game. My game is I, I just do the best work I can and move forward. And I'm not a peripheral visionary. I just, I don't look at what everybody else is doing. You can't kind of, Hey, I do my own thing. And hopefully somebody responds to it. You know? now, I've always wanted to ask um, you and, and also just someone like you who had that experience, that kind of lottery ticket win with Carnival. Yeah. What was it like when you got the call or were you in the room? What was that experience? You're like, we're, you're greenlit. We're going to make this show. Oh, I can remember exactly what it was like when I sold the thing, you know, mm -hmm. um, Cause I was at a, I was at a, um, my, I was at my, a little, I was like a, at my daughter's softball game. I remember where I was standing. I remember the, looking at my, 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 uh, looking at her mother and going, Oh my God. Um, our life just changed. It, well, it was like, they're doing it. The, the, the problem was I just, I'd never tried to get into TV before then. And so I couldn't fully appreciate how amazing it was. You know, it was kind of like, yeah, of course they bought it. It's good. I guess that's what I, my, my, my dad, when I was like, when I was like 17, he took me to Santa Anita racetrack. Right. And I, it's just beginner's luck. I picked seven out of nine horses on the notes. And, <laughs> and I remember sitting there and I was making these $2 bets. My dad's giving me two bucks and I go make a bet and go home with a couple of hundred bucks and I'm thinking, yeah, maybe this college thing is overrated. You know, <laughs> the, the track, the track just seems much more easy. So then I went back with a girlfriend, you know, expecting to impress her, and I didn't. You know, it's like, you know, they were like, you know, my horses. It was like they were shooting them out there. It was like, oh yeah, he broke his front leg. I'm taking that. Um, so like, you know, I was totally humiliated and realized, oh my god. And and it, there were a lot of aspects of carnival that were like that. I I wasn't. I wasn't, um, I, I hadn't gotten beaten up enough to really fully appreciate it um, in the market. I hadn't spent a lot of time trying to network or sell things. What I'd done is I'd spent 20 years um, really honing my craft, you know, and that was good. And if I was going to do it another, I'd rather do it that way than the other way. I don't think Hollywood's a good place to learn how to write in. So you, know? you so you were basically training for a fight that you never knew was going to come or not come, but when it finally came, you were ready. Oh, yeah, I've been doing like Brazilian jiu-jitsu for twenty years with you know, <laughs> in, a, in a basement somewhere. For, you know, no yeah. one knew who you were. <laughs> um, yeah, I was like, you know, I was bringing, you know, just bringing guys in and, and, and breaking their necks. There'd be no fucking witnesses. <laughs> but, and, so by the time I I was fully evolved, I mean I. I I really was, I, I had, I had honed it to a fine point. Um, and in utter, a, 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 in a total obscurity. Um, and, awesome. um, a lot of people, you know, you get into it. The problem I see with like getting into, you know, graduating from college, getting that first job, you reach a point where you're pulling down a six figure paycheck and you kind of go, well, I guess I know everything I need to know about writing and your development as an artist just stops the other thing is I had 20, I had 25. Well, by the time I did, I was, I had four decades plus of living I'd done and I, I had a lot of experiences and, and, you know, um, I had a lot to draw on mm -hmm. versus some guy who's 20 years old and he has like, I, I had a really bad breakup in high school. <laughs> you know, there was that time I got kicked in the nards in, 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 in seventh grade. In seventh grade. I mean, there's just, you, you know, there's not a lot of complexity to what you can look back on at 22 years old. Whereas at 45, I had three kids. Mm -hmm. I you know, feeling. Really, there'd been the health, there'd been health problems. There'd been, you know, a million, a million things. And so it's like, I could draw on all of that. Now you um you also acted as a showrunner on a few shows. Can you tell us which shows you worked on specifically as a showrunner? I was never really the a showrunner on Carnival, but I was kind of the showrunner by default on Carnival because the second season Ron went away to do um, Battlestar Galactica, and I was basically the head writer. I was doing everything a showrunner does, 
Um, but it, you know, but but at the end of the day, there was another executive producer who was who was handling most of the post production and you know calling certain shots. So I wasn't really a pure showrunner, but I was making a, a lot of creative decisions, and a lot of the crew were making end runs around the other guy to say, hey, you know, we're trying to get a decision. He hasn't, you know, and he's putting this one to committee, and we really need to know now. And I'd say, just do this, you know. Um, so, I, I mean, I know what a showrunner's job was. And so I know that in the second season, I was the de facto showrunner. Now, what does a showrunner do exactly for the audience so they understand? The showrunner is basically responsible for, first of all, uh, pretty much all the scripts and the trajectory of what's going on in the writing room and the story of what's being submitted to the network, dealing with all the notes that come back from the network, dealing with the production issues that come up, um, looking at you know, drawings of sets that are going to be built and signing off on those. You're signing off on everything. You're generally, you're generally, you know, working directly with your key uh, crew and your, your line producers um, to just make sure that everything's running, that all the trains are running on time and, um, and doing what you can do to, to make their job. I would say, I would say easier but sometimes I think just to make their job possible, I mean, it's, <laughs> it, it's really, a, it's really, this is, this is pyramid building, you know, and you're building a new pyramid every week and you're building each pyramid from the factory floor up. And, and so there's a lot of details that need attending to. You're also, you know, you're delegating a lot. You can't be, you know, you can't have your hand in everything. Um, you just have to make sure that the right people who reflect and understand your vision for things are in the slots, you know. Now, can you talk a little bit about the writer's room and what it's like to be in that writer's room for people who have never been in a writer's room? Well, I've, there's, I've been in both. I've been in two kinds. There's really only two kinds of writer's rooms. Um, well, there's, no, there's, there's lots of different kinds of writer's rooms. Um, there's writer's rooms that work and writer's rooms that don't work. Um, there's <laughs> where, you know, um, the shows that I've run, the shows that I've been in charge of the writer's room, I take great pride in when, when I'm running a room, it's running on all cylinders. And um, you have five or six writers in a room, and I'm usually a writer's assistant taking notes. You have, you're have you using cards or whiteboards, and you're breaking story. Your job is to sit as a group and break story. And to me, the key is, first of all, everybody has to feel safe. You know, they have to feel like they're not going to be um, ridiculed if they come up with something silly. Um, one thing that I really like, Ron Moore brought this to our room at Carnival. And, it, and according to him, it's it's an old Gene Roddenberry t- trick. Um, mm-hmm. It's a thing called a stupid stick. And you designate something. It can be anything. It can just be an object. And if you pick this thing up and you hold it and pitch something, nobody can make fun of you. It's got supernatural powers. That's awesome. <laughs> so, and often it's the stupid stick pitch that really picks, gets, breaks the dam. Like usually the reaction is that, like you shouldn't have picked up the stupid stick. That's actually really smart. Or it'll be, yeah, that's stupid. But, you know, if you did that, which fly, gets every, it, it just breaks a log jam. Um, mm-hmm. And I mean, really the, the key to me of, of successfully running a room and I think the best, I love analogies, but the best analogy I've found for a writer's room um, is, you know, you're drawing, you're drawing juice, you're drawing story out of the ether as a writer. Um, it's bubbling up through your story. Well, it's being informed by your own experiences. It's being filtered by your own experiences and interpreted by your own experiences. But that story comes from somewhere else. I truly believe the more I do this, that writers and artists, artists of all stripe are the only people on earth that are actually in daily, um, who, who, in daily communication with, with, uh, supernatural. I mean, I just, there's it's something else. I can't tell you how many times I've written something and gone, where the fuck did that come from? Oh yeah. You know, I, <laughs> holy shit. Like that's, that didn't come out of me, you know, <laughs> and it's nothing I've ever seen and it's nothing I've ever experienced for God's sake. And it's coming from somewhere else. And so you're, you're basically a light bulb and 
there's a power station down, you know, down the down the street. I look at it as you know to keep the power station thing going. It's like you're driving through the desert here in California, and there's you know, you're out towards Nevada, and there's these uh, solar collectors, mm-hmm. and it's you know hundreds of mirrors on the desert floor. All of those mirrors focused on uh, a heat element at the top of a tower that is you know moving turbines down below. And I look at it as a good writer's room is all the people are taking that, that mojo, that story mojo, that juice and sort of focusing it on, you know, on, on the person who's running the room. And, and, and it's like, it's amplifying everybody there. You can't, if you have a good, well run writer's room, nobody can really remember who came up with what Right. it becomes, it becomes, it becomes a pure hive mind, and, and I'm not just saying it because I like Star Trek. But it becomes a, <laughs> it becomes a hive mind, and there's only one writer in the room. There really is only one writer in the room, but he's he's a combination of you know the the, the four or six or twelve twelve writers that are all sitting in the room, focusing their mirrors at, at that center point, which is just you know, forging the story. Um, and it all kind of melts together, you know? Um, Mm -hmm. and so it's not, you know, the, the 12 equals one, 12 creates one writer, you know, and that, that takes immense trust. Um, and, and in the process in, and, um, and, a, a measure of generosity and more than that, just making sure it's fun. And because, because creation is play. Creation is play at a very high level. Yes. But it's nevertheless, it's no different than, you know, like six kids in a sandbox right. with truck, playing with trucks, you know, or army man or something. It, it's you're in a state of play and you need to make people feel like good. Yeah. <laughs> if not that plays not yeah because if you if you if you're making kids not feel fun they're not going to play in that sandbox what they're going to do is they're going to retreat to their corners and pound and it, i've seen that happen in writers rooms i mean there's writers rooms where it's like it's just everybody's just staring a hole in the whiteboard and it's like what if we uh what oh uh, yeah you know. <laughs> just it's like just so constipated. Right. Just, Oh my God, I've been in rooms like that. And it's just like, and usually it's a function of people at the top. Yeah, it's, usually usually, is. it's a trickle down effect of, an, of, of, of the way that ideas are received. Um, shows like that are not fun. You know? Now let me ask you a question. How do you deal with studio notes? or notes in general from people who have not sat and bled on the paper like you have or on your laptop to build that story? Well, first of all, you know, I keep in mind that everybody, everybody involved wants to make the material good. Now you'd argue there's probably a few people out there that just want to get their fingerprints on it. And there's a good Mm -hmm. argument for that. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like they want to be able to turn to their wife and see, Hey, see that sweater. I picked that sweater out for that actress or something. Mm -hmm. I, I don't know. Um, I don't, I think that's more the exception to the rule. Everybody is just dying to make something great. And, and, um, and sometimes if it's coming from, um, people who don't understand the process, like executives, um, it may not be as well articulated as it would be if you were getting it from another writer, you know, and thank God for that, because if they were capable of articulating it as well as a writer, they wouldn't need us. <laughs> <laughs> so, so um, that said, you know, I, I, I'd say, you know, I read every every year I see some article and some basically on the Internet or whatever, some blog or some screenwriting magazine and be like, the dumbest notes I ever got. And it's mm-hmm. a bunch of writers talking about the dumbest note I ever got. And to this day, I've never seen anybody write one saying the smartest note I ever got. Because I can tell you, for every really stupid note I've gotten, I've gotten one where I'm kicking myself in the ass on my way home going, why the hell didn't I think of that? Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes people come up with, with things where it's like, oh, wow, you're absolutely right. Um, I think the, the biggest problem is a lot of the notes 
um, they have they, a lot of executives. They want to pitch a solution. They perceive a problem, and they they tend to frame their notes as solutions to problems they perceive. Mm-hmm. So it'll be, hey, you know, do this, and you're kind of going, huh? Like it feel, and it's like it's it. If there's any executives listening or any future executives, the best thing to do is just frame the problem first. You know what I mean? Um, oh, the the second hack, or you know, and be as specific as you can. I'm this really bumps for me. You know, um, this particular moment or this the second scene kind of drags, or it seems like this one character disappears in you know in the second act, and you know, frame the problem. Don't try to just pitch a solution um, because the solution, it's, it's sort of like, you know, you got a doctor. There's only one doctor in the room and, and then you got a bunch of people who are standing around in the room and they bring a patient in and he's bleeding from the ears. And everybody sits, says, for God's sake, put cotton in his ears and put some band-aids on his ears. His ears are bleeding. There's a doctor and you're going, no, actually that's indication of like, you know, you know, that's intracranial bleeding and we really have to get him into an MRI, see what's going on with his brain, you know? Um, and it's not a band aid on the ears situation. (laughs) Um, so, you know, it's sometimes it's better just to point out, Hey, he's bleeding from from the ears, not, Hey, put some band aids on his ears. You know, it's it's just better to frame the problem or point out the problem than, and propose a solution. You are um, good at analogies, by the way. You are very good at analogies. <laughs> uh, thank you. I should open up a little store. You should just sell analogies. <laughs> analogies are us. <laughs> now, what is the biggest mistake you see first-time screenwriters make? Um, the biggest mistake screenwriters make. I would say the biggest mistake all writers, new writers make, and even a few that are like along the way is not recognizing a lot of people go, you know, if I get it really good the first time, it'll save me time on editing. You know, I can edit and write at the same time. I can multitask. I can work with my iPad and watch TV at the same time. So I can edit and write at the same time. And then they sit down, which in really editing is using a completely different part of your brain than writing. It's a completely, it's as different as the difference between, oh, I'm just doing an analogy, but it's as different as the difference between skiing and eating a banana. Right. I mean, like there's, they have <laughs> nothing to do with each other. Now, I suppose you could ski while you're eating a banana. But Not well. <laughs> The thing is, the thing is, it's, it's like it's really they're, they're 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 mutually exclusive activities, and and what I find is the effect is like when people do that and they go, the, that's where you get into the it was a dark and stormy night. Oh no no no, that sucks. <laughs> it, was, it, it was a shadowy and rainy night. Oh, that's worse. You know? and <laughs> the, this is the recipe for complete writer's block and paralysis mm-hmm. uh, where you're trying to make qualitative decisions about things that are just dumping out of your head. Okay. Right. You cannot do it. You cannot do that. You can't do it. It is like, like pegging the accelerator and the brake on your car at the same time. You're going to make shit loads of noise and a lot of smoke, but the car ain't going anywhere. Okay. And so it's like, it's like understand that, you know, when you sit down to write, you write like you're being pursued through the jungle by a bunch of guys with machetes. You don't think about it. You go, you can be thinking, oh, this is shit. I know it's shit, but I've got to get through this scene. Okay, I know what the next scene's going to be. And just get through it. Get through it. Get through it. Get through it. Right forward. Don't. And what, for Christ's sake, when you sit down to write, don't sit down and read everything you've written before you write. Okay, because now you're editing again. Stop that. No. So you just sit down, you read the last few words, and you go, oh, yeah, that's where I left off, and you just pick it up. And you you have to write like you're just – now, and it's okay. If you if you go off of your outline, that's all right. If something happens and the character takes you in a direction you didn't expect to go, 
great. Okay. You know, and sometimes those are great moments. And so go ahead. But as long as you get back onto your, you know, onto the path again and, mm-hmm. and, and arrive at your trajectory and re- arrive at your ending, but just get that first draft out get it out as quickly as humanly possible. And, and I can guarantee you that the parts that you thought while you were writing them were just shit on ice. Actually, you'll reread them and you go, well, this isn't bad. And the stuff you thought where you were, oh, my God, I must be channeling, you know, uh, Eugene O'Neill, you know, <laughs> it's just garbage, you know. And so it's like it's like you have no way of knowing how well you're doing while you're creating. You can't be. You know, so that's yeah. another reason. So so my advice to writers is understand that process and understand editing and and and, and writing and editing the creative process. And the editing process are two completely different things. And, um, you know, and, and don't try to don't try to multitask that. It never goes well. I actually heard I actually heard a great analogy um, from a songwriter, and uh, which I think is an amazing analogy for writing, which is like when you go into an old house and you turn on the pipes and all you see is that mud come out. You just got to let it go and let that mud keep flowing out of the pipes, out of this faucet. And then sooner or later, it's going to start, it starts getting lighter and lighter and lighter to the point where then you're getting clear water that you can actually drink, but you have to get through all that other stuff first or else it won't, you won't get to the good stuff. So you just have to, you, you, it's like, it's like, it's, it's, it's an ugly, messy, smelly process. (laughs) There's nothing, there's nothing, there's nothing, um, glamorous about, being an artist a lot of times it really is it not when you're real creative you know when i'm 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 one of those i'm one of those rare birds a lot of people are like you know they hate writing oh you know they're tortured they're sitting in front of their i've seen guys sitting there sitting there frowning at their screens and you know doing this. i'm happy and giddy and stupid when i'm writing i mean i'm just like laughing i'm like like I'm just sitting here making faces, going, "Oh God, look! They're all going to be crying here. This is going to be so great." Well, you actually just said that right when we got on the on the on the line. You were like, "I'm writing a ghost story." Like you were so happy about it when you said it. (laughs) That's because I love this process. I I, I, there's tons of love on the page. I just adore writing. Um, I'm not one of those guys that's like, "Well, I like having written." (laughs) Yeah, it's like I like the process. I like. I, I like doing it. It's one, you know, it's funny. There's that, I forget what it is. It's some recent, you know, one of those self-help business type books. And they made this prop proposal. And they go, if you do any endeavor or activity for 10,000 hours, yes. you'll become a And it's like, okay, so if you want to be a, if you want to be a concert pianist, you just have to play for 10,000 hours. You know? What he doesn't say <laughs> is that if you didn't like playing the piano, right. you'd have to be the world's dumbest asshole to waste 10,000 hours of your life doing something you don't like doing. People who spend 10,000 of their hours of their life mastering some art or craft or science or whatever they master, they have to love it. You have to love doing that. But there's a lot of people that don't. A lot of people who go to school. You have to love love some aspect. Should. You know. Um, But, you know, I mean, a lot of people fall in love with the idea of being a writer, you know. But I meet writers every day that have never written a word. They're just natural raconteurs. They're really good at telling stories. They're just – and it's like where I go, for God's sake, I wish you'd sit down and write a book or something because you're really good, you, you know. And then I meet people who are writers and they're making very good money. You know, I've worked with people who are writers and it's like they're not writers. They've they've worked out the craft. They understand what follows what, but they're not really writers. They're just they're just regurgitating things they've seen and, and putting a spin on everything to make it, you know, to make it a little fresh enough to where everybody doesn't, you know. Get scared. Go, yeah, you know. that's an interesting. That's a, that's a very interesting because you, sometimes you see these movies or you watch these shows and you're like, wow, it's just the same, the same stuff. And I've met writers too. I've met writers and filmmakers for that matter who do exactly what you do. They understand the craft. They're technicians, but oh, yeah. but can, like you know, I could put the paint on canvas and I know how to do it and I know the technique, yeah. but 
I'm not Da Vinci. <laughs> I'm no. not, I'm not Van Gogh. I'm not, I'm not being brave. I'm not being, you know, I'm not going out there uh, without a net. Well, yeah, I mean, it, but that's just, you know, maybe that's the cards that are dealt you. You know, not mm-hmm. everybody is, you know, I, I mean, there's probably guys painting pictures from, you know, photographs down at the mall that, you know, from a craft and from a, from a craft standpoint, as far as mixing colors and laying down paint are probably, you know, highly evolved, you know, but the, there's directors like that. I won't name any names, but there's directors that are absolutely masterful, but it's just not quite substantial. There's a, there's an, it's hard to put your finger on it, but it's like, there's a sense of a missing depth to it. Yeah, you read my mind. It, yeah. That, that, that somebody like Kubrick brings to the party, you know, or, or Scorsese or, you know, where there's, there's something really to it. And there's something underneath that. There's like 50 layers underneath and you will yeah. only see it in 20 or 30 years of watching the movie that you'll yeah. see. Kubrick. Yeah. Did, Kubrick's my favorite. You, you know, he was aware of uh, what he was doing and everything, but he wasn't aware of everything he was doing. And no mm-hmm. artist really is. A Correct. lot of it, you're just doing your best and it's coming in that way, but you really do have no idea. Um, you know, how, how, why it works that way. You know, you're just focusing on trying to articulate your vision as well as you can. Yeah. I mean, you know, I, I, you, know I take, you go to college lit classes and you get some clown, you know, up in front, he's your college lit teacher. And he's trying to tell you what was going through Herman Melville's head. When he was <laughs> writing, you know, Moby Dick or Stephen Crane's head when he was writing red badge of courage. And yeah, he was thinking about this. And he was working with symbolism over here. And, it's, and I tell people, I go, I can tell you what was going through Herman Melville's head when he wrote Mer- Moby Dick. It was like, I got to feed my family. And this thing's due in a couple of months. You know, it's like, <laughs> that's what was going through Herman Melville's head. It's like, right. I got to pay bills, you know. Right. You're doing the best you can. You're running through the jungle with the guys with the machetes behind you. That's what's happening. You know, it's funny because uh, Kubrick, Kubrick's one of my favorite artists of all time and and there's so yeah. much i mean there's volumes libraries written about what people think he was doing in 2001 and in the shining and 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 all of those and i just uh, did you see the documentary film worker um uh, i know I it's know. it's it's his assistant uh oh i did see that yeah yeah wasn't it wonderful great. wasn't it wonderful oh. but you hear him and he was the guy that was literally next to him for 30 years and he's like you know the twins in shining well that was me I brought twins in and Kubrick said, Shh, well, I guess they're twins now where everybody's like in there's twins because back in the day he shot some photos of twins and they're putting up and like, no, <laughs> it just happened it was, to be that way. Huh? Yeah, it was the first episode of the first episode of Carnival. It's called Milfe. Right? Mm-hmm. And um, I decided, you know, when I first created the show, I wanted to name each episode after each city they were in. We didn't do that the first year. We did it in the second year, you know, mm-hmm. but uh, I titled the episode no Fay, you know, and the way I found it is I got a period, a period map of the dust bowl and sort of looked at dots on the map and found a little tiny dot named no Fay, And I went, Oh, I like that. And so that's what I titled it. So then we make it and like two years later, it's on TV and people are talking about it on the internet and going back and forth with their interpretations and stuff. And some guy says, well, you do know. And, <laughs> you do. and Milfe is an anagram for family. And I'm going, wow, I'm a genius. Man. <laughs> <laughs> and I was, you know, it was like, I couldn't have been thinking about that. You know, I couldn't have done, I couldn't, I'm not going to be thinking about stuff like that. You know, when I'm making creative, because I'm making 10,000 10, creative decisions in the course of a screenplay, you know, it's 10,000 decisions to make. You can't be thinking on that level about every one. You'd never finish. You'd be, <laughs> still be writing the pilot today. No, so, so when Carnival came out, um, the internet was, Definitely off and running is already around for a little bit, and but then mm. the message boards and all that stuff was going on back then heavily. Mm. And I yeah. remember people just you know, because it wasn't there wasn't as much content flying around as there is today, yeah. And they really delved into the deep, the deepness of Carnival. How is it as a creator? I've always wanted to hear this as a creator to go on 
and just Louis, I'm like, you guys have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> like Woody Allen's well, like, you that- I, I no, because uh, like I said, people have different interpretations for different sure, things. Sure, sure, sure. That's, that's the, nobody does that when they're talking about CSI or right. CIA. <laughs> right. Or even shows like House, you know. Right. They're they're not even really doing stuff like that on the Sopranos so much. But the minute they start to interpret stuff, symbolism and so forth, mm-hmm. what things really mean, connections between different elements, as soon as people start doing that, you're talking now, that's what people do about art. Okay? Mm-hmm. And that means you've succeeded and you've made art. It's not just a TV show, you've made art. And so that was the biggest thing. I mean, I'm not gonna say, oh, you're wrong. Because they could be right. I mean, to me, it's, 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 there's a collaboration happening between the artist and the audience. If the audience draws something out of it that the artist didn't intend, does that mean it's not there? Absolutely not. You know? That's a great perspective. It, well, yeah, why wouldn't it? It should be. If it's open to multiple interpretations, that's a good thing. It be, that, that's because you're reaching people, different people in different ways. It's almost like, the, the the story in the Bible of uh, the, the apostles speaking tongues or something. Mm-hmm. You know, everybody's hearing a different language. Um, that's fine. That's good. <laughs> that's well, it's, yeah, like go, to go back to Kubrick, every one of his movies has been interpreted a thousand different ways and will yeah. continue to be interpreted for the, for decades and decades to come in different ways. That's because his work is art, which, yeah. which brings me to my poetry. I should pitch my poetry. Please, please pitch your poetry. Yeah, I was going to ask you what's next on your plate. Well, I'm doing a bunch of stuff. I'm, 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 I mean, it's like I've been, I've been creating shows that don't go on. <laughs> <laughs> um, you can check them all out. I mean, it's like people go, well, gosh, you haven't done anything. Since, you haven't created anything since Carnival. It's like, no, I've created like a bunch of shows. And, and for, I don't know why. I mean, I reread a bunch of them and I was saying, this, this is good. This could go tomorrow. I don't know what the deal is. <laughs> um, but um, I, I've got a, a site called Noth TV, and you can see it's, – it's unusual because you can see the actual pilots in their entirety on some of the projects. There's another thing called the Bible, which we talked about earlier in the show. Mm-hmm. And you very rarely get to see show Bibles on the internet. This mm-hmm. will give you an idea of what a Bible looks like, like what a show Bible looks like. Um, so it's a nice resource for new writers. Um, and then uh, – and then, and then there's these things we call decks, which are sort of like anywhere between an 11 and 15 page version of a Bible, like mostly sizzle, very little steak, just giving, it's the kind of thing they call leave behind. You might take it to a pitch meeting with you and leave something behind for the executives to pass up the chain of command. So some of those too. So they're, they're helpful selling things and that's all on Nauf, K-N-A-U-F dot TV. And uh, I'll put it in the show can, notes. Um, the other thing, the other thing is, I recently, I got, I started writing poetry again. I, I wrote it. I wrote poetry when I first started writing. Um, as a, you know, when I, I was an art major, and then I flipped over to, to creative writing, and and I was drawn to that. I did a, a lot of poetry and worked with a lot of really great, had a lot of great poets or teachers. That was where I sort of cut my teeth in. Um, I started writing again um, about six, seven years ago. And for like five years, I was writing these these poems and just posting them on Facebook. I would just post them on Facebook. and Because it's like, who gets paid for writing plays? What am I going to submit it to? I don't po- know poetry, it's... poetry magazine? <laughs> yeah. Po- yeah. Poetry. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> jugs. <laughs> po- poetry. The jugs jugs. of poetry magazine. <laughs> yeah. It's a wee we magazine does that still even exist i don't know and so um so i i, I just posted them in this uh, this this woman was actually collecting and she contacted me and said i've got you've got like 35 poems and and um i thought wow maybe we should do a book so i called another person i knew and as a publisher and she said i would love to publish uh poems by you and so um we did this thing it's called noho gloaming i'm if you go on the, if you go on my Facebook page or Twitter, you'll find it. Um, if you go on the net and you want to find it, just put it in clash books is the publisher. Mm-hmm. Um, C L A C C L A S H books. And the book is no ho N O H O gloaming G L O A M I N G. Um, and there's links all over my, my web, my, my, my social networks and so forth. And it's um, 
it's about as pure. I mean, it's like when you do TV, and like we're not about the note process. It's a, it's your your vision is mitigated by a lot of people. You know, it, it's very rare where you get really the raw stuff up mm-hmm. because it takes so many people just to make these damn things. You know, um, and you know everybody's. You know, it's going to waver from the way you might have imagined it. You know, down to you know props and camera angles. And it's all a myriad of details. And it was so nice to return to a form where I'm creating the end result right there on a page. And uh, so, and it's very approachable. It's not. It's not. Po- if you don't like, like, if you think of poetry the way I think of mimes, okay. <laughs> 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 and you're allergic to poetry and you're going, uh, oh, you know, it's not this precious stuff. It's, it's very relatable. I believe that if somebody, I believe people will read it and they'll connect very deeply with it. Mm-hmm. There's one poem at the end. that's an epic poem. that's just crazy and kind of funny. And it's, it's the story of a guy in the witness protection program. Um, yeah, I mean, it's not, I mean, I'm not writing about ravens and, and <laughs> angels and, you know, dead king trees, shit. right? <laughs> yeah, I'm writing about stuff like sit go gas stations, so, right? Um, my influences were Charles Bukowski and this whole Los Angeles, uh, mm-hmm. Brian Baroque school. Um, and it's very down to earth and sort of grounded, straight up stuff, and, That's awesome. and sometimes amusing and sometimes moving. So, I urge you to check out my poetry if you like my TV. You'll, you'll really like that. Awesome. Now I'm going to ask you a few questions. I ask all of my guests. Um, yeah. What advice would you give a screen? Oh, is this a thing on the actors thing? Yes, the yes, actors. yes, yes. Exactly. Exactly. It's just like what the actors to do. Odd type shit. Don't do that. To me. I'm not gonna do it. <laughs> it's not going to be. If you were a okay. tree, no, I'm joking. Um, <laughs> what advice would you give a screenwriter wanting to break into the business today? I would say the best thing you can do is skip film school and just start shooting film because you can do that. I couldn't do that when I was starting out as a filmmaker, as a filmmaker. Yeah, I would uh, film school. You will learn everything you learn in four years of film school in five days on a, on a set. Pretty much. You know, it's a film school is the world's biggest waste of money. Unless you go to UCLA or NYU or USC. USC yeah. And, and otherwise, if you're going to some other college to get a, communications degree or film degree or that you are totally wasting your time. If you want to be a filmmaker, take, take shit, take 25, tell your parents, say, okay, I want to take 25% of what you would spend on a college and I want to make a movie with it. Just make movies, write them, get your friends together. If somebody has a good eye and make him the director. Now just make, go out and start making movies. Um, and, and, you know, you might not monetize, but you'll get from here to there much faster than you will if you go to film school. For and how about screenwriting? For screenwriting, um, you know, I think the most important thing I would tell a writer who wants to be a dramatist, which is a very specific kind of writing. Um, people think that, you know, novelists think, oh, I can not, I can adapt this into a script. They usually can. It's very specific. Shakespeare was an actor before he was a writer. And I really, I didn't really learn how to be a dramatist until I studied acting and I studied acting by accident. I thought I wanted to be a director. And so one of my, my second mentor who was really important in my development was a guy named Cliff Osmond, who was an acting, t- an acting coach. He was Armand DeSante's, um, a- you know, acting consultant. And I, I met him on a set. And we got to be good friends. And I said, I want to take some of your classes because I want to learn about the process so I can interact with actors as a director. And what I did was I ended up learning how to write. I learned, I really learned, I was really good at packing the trunk and I knew how to, um, to break a story and, and, and figure out what follows this and what follows that. When it came to my character work, um, I was faking it until I studied acting and you'll learn one thing you learn in acting is is to act in the moment. Now, if you're you got stage fright, I have terrible stage fright. When I'm playing somebody other than myself, I can get up in front of a zillion people mm-hmm. being damned off. I don't, you know, but if I'm playing a character, it's scary. Um, and uh, you know, I, I just can't build that fourth wall. But when I'm alone in a room, I can. 
in um, I, I'm writing in the moment. I'm mostly my scene work feels like tr- I'm just taking transcription. I know my characters so well. I know what they're saying. All I'm doing is just trying to keep up with them while they're while they're talking, going through a scene. I never am going. Hmm. What would he say there? Hmm. What would she then say? Another thing I'd say to young actors or young young writers is that uh, uh, sort of a sort of attached to that mm-hmm. is if you're going to a place like that and you're going, what would I say if I was in that situation? What would I say if somebody said that to me is nobody really gives a fuck what you would say. Okay. <laughs> because you're really not interesting. Actors aren't doers. Actors are watchers. If you're boring, just boring, boring people. And so nobody cares what you'll see. You have to understand your character and what the character would say. They all have to have different voices. They have to be real, you know? So again, I would really strongly suggest studying, spending at least a couple of years, um, you know, in any way you can and whatever resource your town or city has, um, getting up and studying acting and doing scenes and seeing how hard it is. And it also helps you develop a really strong respect for your, for the actor and how mm-hmm. hard they're and that's something that's sorely lacking with many writers in Hollywood, where I'll hear them going, oh, yeah, that guy, he's a shitty actor, he just he sucks. And it's like, has it occurred to you that, you know, you're writing shitty stuff for him to say? Like, you know, there's no way to make him work well, asshole. Right. You know? <laughs> if, Meryl, if Meryl Streep was saying it, it wouldn't have worked. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you can get to where you write, and when you're in there and you're doing it, you're working with actors, you know actors, you get to understand the kind of stuff the actors want to say, right. that the kinds of moments actors want to play. And if you know that and you get them on your side, I mean, you know, that's good. That's something that's going to make you stand out. You know? Now, can you tell me what book had the biggest impact on your life or career? The biggest the book that had the biggest impact on my life or my career or in mm-hmm. my career? Or, or, and? or, or. Either or, I would say at this point, you know, it's, I was a late comer to it was, uh, um, well, let me think. There's, a, there's so many of them. Whichever one comes to your mind. The Alchemist. Oh, of course. I love The Alchemist. It's one of my favorite it's, books. It's, it's an astonishing book. Piece of work. And it's a, uh, I think everybody should, everybody should read it. It should be required. It should be required for everybody in the world, but especially those who are artists. <laughs> I think uh, even I, so. I think, I think, yeah, but I think for everybody. I, I think, think so, too. I, I think it's a good – it's about as close a thing to – uh, uh, like uh, if Homo sapiens came with an owner's manual, it would be the alchemist. <laughs> I agree know? with you. I would it's agree common. with you. Good answer. Good answer. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film industry or in life? Hmm. Um, that I'm not always right. You know, uh, that sometimes um, I've been in situations where I'm absolutely sure something's not going to work. And, and, and that person has, you know, higher rank than I do. So they're the ones who get to call the shot. And I'm thinking, hey, this is going to not work. It's not going to work as well as the way I would have done it. And then all of a sudden I watch it and it works beautifully, you know, and, and I go, hmm, you know what? I was wrong. Um, you know, it's like, this is the way, you know, just cause it's the way you would do it doesn't mean it's the best way to do it. And, and, um, and in, when it comes to a, a collaborative art, passion rules the day. And, you know, what it boils down to is the person who's most passionate is probably going to win that fight. Don't get hung up on little stuff. If people want this change, the worst place you can go, the least productive, most toxic place you can go is to this place that almost every shitty writer goes, which is, they're trying to wreck my work, you know? And it's like, yeah, they're dumping shitloads of money into this and they just want to wreck it because they don't like you. They're mean people and they want to do <laughs> You know, let's go. Come on, for God's sake. You know, I mean, sometimes, sometimes another way does work. And sometimes it works even a little better than the way you had in mind. Just don't, 
don't think that you're ever going to watch something that, that is exactly the movie you had in your mind when you conceived it and wrote it. It's always going to be a little different. Some parts are going to be better. Some parts you might wince at. Um, hopefully the, you know, the former is more numerous than the latter, you know? Very good. And then the toughest question of all three of your favorite films of all time. Oh, that is tough. North by Northwest. I love, I Amazing. love that. Film. Amazing. Um, uh, I think, um, uh, let's see, there's a lot of them. Uh, I'm just going to see what pops into my head. Oh, Casablanca. Of course. Of course. Um, and then I think it's probably, uh, it's probably a, geez, it's really kind of a dead heat between Chinatown Oof, and, uh, and, and, um, and the shining. Oh, I really oof, and, love the shining. But, there's, there's, but I can name a dozen more movies. Of course. There's those four. Right. So. Exactly. That just came into your mind right now. No, I, I agree with you hundred percent. And I mean, everything by David Lynch. Can, does that count? Everything, everything, David everything by Kubrick, David. everything by David Lynch. <laughs> And every other movie by the Coen brothers. It's like that. <laughs> it is every other Coen. <laughs> You're right. It is almost every other movie. Cause, but when they hit it, they hit it out of the park. I know. But when they strike out, they sw- but you know what though? No, they, it, even when they strike out, it's an interesting strike. Out. That's what it's I was okay. about to say. I was about to say, even when they strike out, at least they're going to places that is pushing them creatively in places that we might've never even been to. So for every uh, there, no country for old men, there might be a lady killer. <laughs> hey, do you, do you do editing on this thing after you're done? I do not. You don't? We go straight through. I go so straight. I can't. I'm, I'm going to say, honey, <laughs> keep it down. I'm on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> no, my audience is used to this, so it's all good. Don't worry. Okay. And then where can people find you? She just work? dropped her purse on the, on it, the, on it, the it, table. It's, it was, it's, Probably sounded like the like the bomb. bomb it's all good. Stuff. It's all good. Now, where can people find you in your work? Uh, people can find all of these things I've done at Noth TV, and then you can find my stuff. I mean, you know, I mean, it, it's I'm pretty active in, in in on Twitter and the social networks. There's interviews. You know, just Google my ass, <laughs> and you'll pop Don't up. Google Daniel Roth. Don't Google my ass because <laughs> that. There, there, you can find me all over the place. And as far as what I'm doing right now, right now I'm kind of, I finished up, I did three years on the blacklist and I'm kind of been doing a lot of development. So I'm right now I'm kind of, I'm, I'm, I'm kind of, I'm between jobs. Okay. You know, <laughs> what is it? <laughs> as Henry and Eraserhead would say, I'm on a vacation. <laughs> I'm on a vacation. Asian. You're on sabbatical, uh, sir. You're on sabbatical. You know, a psychic sabbatical, sure. Yeah. <laughs> Daniel, uh, I, it, it's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for being so kind yeah, and generous with your time. Sure. Thank you. I, 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 I enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed going inside the mind of Daniel Knopf. If you want to get links to anything we spoke about in this episode, head over to the show notes at bulletproofscreenwriting.tv forward slash ism005. And if you like the show, please subscribe and leave us a review on Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Spreaker, wherever you listen to the show. Head over to screenwritersmind.com. Thank you for listening. And as always, write, rewrite, sell, repeat. I'll talk to you next week. Thank you for listening to Inside the Screenwriter's Mind with Alex Ferrari at ScreenwritersMind.com. And for more great filmmaking and screenwriting podcasts, go to IFHPodcastNetwork.com.